Today on Monkey Life. Tears as the team say goodbye to one of the park's original chimps. It's really sad, but it's part of the job. What just happened in there is probably one of the most important things that we can do. Cat tries to solve a golden cheat gibbon grooming mystery by capturing it on film. Just put a few different cameras around and see if we can maybe get some of that, because it's really frustrating not being able to see it for myself. And Capuchin Joanne solves a sandy problem. Monkey World in Dorset, buried deep in the English countryside, is the largest sanctuary of its kind on the planet. The team, led by Dr. Alison Cronin, rescue and rehabilitate abused and unwanted primates from all over the world. She's alert, um, looking around. Quiet though, which is nice. All good. The park provides a home for more than 260 primates from 24 different species. Life has been difficult for everyone at Monkey World recently, and now the chimp team have an additional worry. Jimmy, one of the park's original nine chimps, isn't well. Staff have been monitoring him closely after noticing he wasn't engaging with them or the other chimps and was lethargic. He's also developed a nasty cough and has a swollen abdomen. The team's concern is growing. He's been up and down for, for a fair while now. We're not really sure what the cause has been. There has been a lot of tension in the bachelor group, so part of it could be we could have put it down to like social issues and he's just wanted to keep himself quiet and away from all the drama of the group because he's a very sensible man like that. Um, at one point, he did look to have a bit of a chipped tooth, so we wondered whether it would be a dental issue and maybe he was a bit quiet because his teeth were causing a bit of a problem. And we've been backwards and forward like this for a while and now it's apparent that it might be something a bit more serious, so we're getting him down sort of as soon as we possibly can just to have a look and try and find out what we can do to help him. Local vet Dave Harding has been asked to take a look at Jimmy. He's one of the park's more elderly chimps and thought to be nearly 40 years old. Alison is philosophical about what lies ahead. It's just awful, but it's what we need to be prepared for going forward. Some of our older chimpanzees have now been here more than 30 years, and considering that they came in as sort of, you know, a few years old, that's making them pretty old, and when their backgrounds are as ropey as they are, you know, we're extremely concerned for Jimmy, and I'm not sure what today's gonna bring. The scenario feels horribly familiar. The park recently lost Zoe, another of the original chimps, in similar circumstances. Everyone is hoping today won't have the same outcome. Jimmy isn't the most cooperative of chimps, and it's a struggle to get him to take the anaesthetic by hand injection. But eventually, Kate succeeds. He's immediately whisked off to the park's hospital, where Dave and the vet team are standing by. First, he's weighed. 50.9 minus 2.3. Before being placed on the table where Dave can have his first good look at the chimp. Initial impressions aren't good. There's something quite lumpy there by the feel. Yeah, OK, let's clip that. Dave needs to shave Jimmy's abdomen to perform an ultrasound. Ah, oh, that's a funny-shaped belly. Come on, Jimmy. <clears throat> this will give the clearest indication of anything untoward inside the chimp's body. Immediately, Dave's suspicions are confirmed. Yeah, well, so this is yeah. the, the vena cava, which are both very, very prominent yeah. going into the heart here, but we've got pleural fluid in the chest cavity and we've also got abdominal fluid as well. I can't see any growths per se on the liver. It's just a very, very swollen, massive liver. It's all liver there, um, so. And you're suggesting heart failure would do that? Mm, quite possibly, yeah. It's a blow for the team. Dave checks Jimmy's heart from a different angle. 
So it certainly looks like this heart's enlarged, particularly the right side of the heart, which was the side that would be failing if, uh, if we've got all this fluid. I mean, it doesn't look like it's contracting very well, that heart at all. Um, and the, the, the lining of the heart actually looks quite irregular here as well. You so see? The fibrous, so fibrosing cardiomyopathy, that is. Yeah. The elderly chimp's condition is extremely serious. He has a major heart problem, which in theory could be treated with medication. We could put him onto the diuretics I think today. So. I think so. Chimp team leader Hannah is concerned persuading Jimmy to take the medication would be problematic. There's something to treat, but it's it's whether it's going to do it's, anything. It's a punt, but I reckon yeah. it's less likely than likely. Yeah. The team have to make a very tough decision, whether to attempt to treat Jimmy with medication or let him go peacefully. What I'd say to you, if he were 15 as opposed to 40, yeah. Yeah. then I would go for it. Yeah. But he's not. He's 40 years old. He's been through the war. He know, we know he doesn't like being messed with. Yeah. Jeremy? No, I can't see any point in... You know, I totally agree with... with ending it. I think we probably all agreed that it's really better to... to put him to sleep. The decision is made and hits the team hard. All right. They knew this moment would come. All right, sorry, everybody. He won't suffer. But now it has, they're overcome with emotion. Yeah. I sort of suspected everything that actually came to be. Doesn't make me feel any better about it. It's really sad, but it's part of the job. What just happened in there is probably one of the most important things that we can do. <gasps> it's all very nice, making their lives nice and good, but the final thing you can do for a person is be, them, be there for them in the end and make sure that they're calm, happy, not suffering. And um, so I think we made the right decision for Jimmy today. Never makes it any easier. Jimmy arrived at the park in 1987, along with eight other chimps, all rescued from the beaches of Spain. For many years, he was Paddy's second in command. But after falling out with the females, he moved to the bachelors, where he's been for over 15 years. A gentle and kind chimp who looked out for others, he will be greatly missed. He, he's just a stunning chip, just like very, very refined features, just very, very heavy set. He always looks very stern, which is why it was always it would throw you when he'd all of a sudden come up to you and start jiggling around and want to play with you, but would maintain that very stern expression and you were never too sure, are you actually playing or is there something in your ear? But yeah, he, when he eventually let himself go, it was always delightful to see Jimmy just as silly as some of the rest of them. He was just a, a unique character, the same as they all are. No, I don't think he was, he's never, I don't think he'd ever been particularly ambitious. He's wanting the things that grown-up people want more than youngsters. You would categorise him as a, you know, teenage pest, possibly. Jimmy will be missed by the chimps and by all of us as well. Good relationships between the primates at the park are vitally important creating harmony within the larger groups and establishing close bonds between pairs that can last for years. One such couple are Golden Cheeked Gibbons Peanut and Pung Yo. They've been together for more than 15 years and have successfully raised three children. Today, primate care member Kat is going through their morning routine before releasing them into their large, forested, outdoor enclosure. Hey, babes. Hey, girl. Good girl. So we're down at the support building this morning and we're just um, starting the release process with Peanut and Pungyo. Um, so this is Peanut here and we've just separated Peanut off from Pungyo so that she can have her high value rewards first thing in the morning and then Pung Yo can have his in peace as well. Um, it just keeps them happy while we're out doing the, the fence checks. 
um, where they've got their nice treats and rewards, and then when we come back, we can let them straight out to breakfast. Peanut is the dominant one of the pair and loves her food. Right, Pung Yo, your turn, buddy. To make sure her partner Pung Yo gets his fair share, the couple are kept apart for the first meal of the day. Good job. Pung Yo needs extra high calorie foods to maintain his body weight, unlike his partner. He thinks it's a wonderful treat, he really enjoys it, and he gets peace to eat that because Peanut doesn't get one, because Peanut does not need high calorie extras because she's quite a chunk. <laughs> While the two gibbons finish off the early morning snacks, Cat prepares their outside enclosure, putting their main breakfast into the high feeders. Then they're both let out. Come on then. Let's go. <laughs> hey, Pung Yo, good boy. You were speedy this morning. Come on then. While they enjoy breakfast, Cat can get on with cleaning the bedroom and playroom. But there's a mystery that's been niggling Cat and the rest of the Gibbon team for the last few months. Peanut has patches of fur missing on her body that look suspiciously like she's being overgroomed. The team aren't concerned because she's not showing any sign of skin irritation. But it's a bit confusing because the staff really witness the pair grooming. Both Peanut and Pung Yo are taken away from their mums at very early ages and then hand reared by humans. So they're quite human focused. Um, and they're very focused obviously on their primate care staff. One, because obviously the relationship they have with us and two, whenever we're around, something's happening, whether it's time to go out or food's coming or whatever. So it tends to stop their normal behavior. So quite often if I'm cleaning the playroom, if I just glance out the window, I can see Peanut and Pungyo often grooming or playing in this part of the tunnel. Um, but if they see me looking, they will stop instantly. Um, so what I want to try and do is just capture that on film this morning. Just put a few different cameras around and see if we can maybe get some of that. Cat sets up a number of small cameras, hoping to catch Pungyo enthusiastically grooming his partner. But later, when she reviews the footage, it's not what she was expecting to see. What we found is pretty much all of the footage shows Peanut grooming Pung Yo. Um, and it's actually quite funny watching her because she's like really quite forceful. She's very much in control. Um, Pung Yo doesn't really get a choice as to whether he wants to be groomed or not. It's just happening. Um, but it's actually really nice to know that that is happening for Pung Yo. And um, we did start to think that it was happening. We keep getting little glimpses but it stops very quickly. So it's really nice to see that Peanut is paying him some really nice attention and taking care of him and doing these things. It would have just been really good for us to actually see the footage the other way around as well and know what's going on as to whether that is him causing these ball patches on her. It's only when Cat heads off to the Siamang enclosure that cameras capture the moment. Pung Yo is indeed grooming Peanut when no one else is around and is pulling out some of the longer hairs. Mystery solved. It's been 24 hours since Wooly Monkey Bueno Jr. had an emergency visit from the vet to stitch up some nasty wounds. They were the result of a fight with alpha male LeVar. After a night recovering, he's still subdued. He had a couple of friends for company, plus a small amount of pain relief. The care team were concerned too much medication would result in him interfering with his stitches. This morning, he just wants some peace and quiet. Even a concerned Olivia can't seem to rouse him. She gives him a gentle prod and leans across in greeting. Her half-sister Layla joins them but Junior isn't interested. Sharon from the primate care team is keeping a close eye on things. There's a very, very good chance because there are some stitches um, on his foot and hand. There's a very good chance that some of those are gonna be played with, um, pulled out even. So it's very, 
difficult to sort of stitch up animals like monkeys because they are very inquisitive and they're always pick and play and part of one of their natural behaviours is grooming and that means removing anything that shouldn't be there, <laughs> so whether that's scabs, parasites, stitches. So it's a very good chance that, yeah, that they're going to be played with and fussed with, but um, the vet's done a very good job of sort of stitching up internally and externally, so pretty sure that even if they do manage to pull out a couple of stitches, it shouldn't really alter the healing process too much. Junior has access to the smaller outside enclosure, where the rest of the group are relaxing and eating. But this morning, it holds no appeal. Sharon encourages him to come to the mesh so she can check the wounds. She tempts him with some grapes, and a drink so he'll stay hydrated. But Junior won't budge. I would say Junior's probably our worst patient. Majority of our animals are quite happy to come over and show us hands, feet, arms, turn around. We can ha do a general sort of physical examination without having to be too invasive and they actually see it as a bit of a fun game and a training exercise. Junior does quite enjoy those training exercises as well, unless he's actually injured and then he seems to really withdraw from the primate care staff. He's extremely suspicious of us. So we just need to just kind of keep a little bit more of a distance and just keep an eye on, on anything that he's doing. Eventually, Lavar and the rest of the group come back inside. Junior is careful not to antagonise the ageing dominant male. Instead, he heads to the ground in search of food. Eating is a good sign and means he's probably on the mend. And once he's made it up with Lavar, life will be better all round. A few months ago, the Capuchin team trialled an experiment with Franco's group to see if any of them would display a natural behaviour seen in the wild. Food washing. The result wasn't conclusive, so today they're having another go. This time with Winslow's troop and a slightly modified version. With Franco's, we put their pellets in their clay in the soil and they did kind of put it in the water but that's a behaviour that they kind of do anyway because they quite like to dip their pellet in water, like dipping your biscuits in a drink. So it just makes it mushy and they quite like to eat it that way. So this will kind of be a bit of a better test just to see if they are doing it to wash their food or just to dip their biscuits in the water, really. Keen to test the theory, Katie has prepared a juicy breakfast of sticky strawberries and mushy avocado, which she's hiding in sand-filled tubs and placing close to the pond. For the capuchins, they're high-value food items, and if they don't like the sand, they're going to have to come up with a way of getting rid of it. This troop includes some of the older capuchins at the park, but you'd never know it as they excitedly make a beeline for the sand-filled food trays. After some initial hesitation, they begin foraging in the sand, picking out the gritty fruit. Daisy isn't bothered by the unusual texture of her avocado. Strawberries and sand aren't a typical summer combination, but Esther tucks in. Molly heads across to the pond, but only for a drink. The majority of the group haven't taken into account the availability of the pond, just perfect for food washing. Pippa bypasses it altogether and heads high up on the cargo net to eat her fruit in peace. Onslow is a little more fussy, but rather than washing his fruit, he rubs off the sand before he eats it. Winslow is one of the last out. He's an effective leader, but when it comes to food, he doesn't tend to overexert himself. He's a very good dominant male, so he's very kind of smart socially. He's very good with training, but in terms of like these kind of behaviours, putting all the effort into foraging for his food, probably not so much. 
Capuchins are incredibly bright monkeys. They're problem solvers, often demonstrating forethought and planning to achieve their goal. Most of this group were wild caught. Babe is the only pet trade individual amongst them. The team were hoping some of them may have seen and learned the concept of food washing in their early years, but so far, there's no evidence of it. Yeah, we've got um, some of our older capuchins will have been wild caught. So uh, we've got a little subgroup of older ladies called Molly's Gang and they do like to hang around this area quite a bit, so we might see them using these sand pits. They are quite a bit lower ranking than the other monkeys in the group, so they'll probably kind of come and get involved a little bit later on. Um, but we've got other monkeys like Debbie. Uh, she's definitely one who's really quick to pick up those behaviours. So yeah, we'll just wait and see. But it's Joanne who proves the exception. She examines a sand-covered treat, then heads straight to the pond to wash it off. It's a repeat behaviour, not a one-off. She performs the task again and again. It's just what the team were hoping for. It's been an interesting recap of the experiment. As some members of the group worked out various methods to solve the issue of the sand-covered food, and others ignored it, putting up with the gritty texture despite the solution close by. What the team will never know is whether clever Joanne learned the technique as a youngster in the wild or worked it out for herself. Next time on Monkey Life. Big news as legislation banning the sale and trade of primates in England is announced at the park. Thanks to this amazing place and this amazing person. We're going to bring an end to one of the grimmest trades in the UK. And woolly monkey Leroy shows he's growing up fast. <laughs>